this episode of United. Anyone for tennis? We'll show you how to hit the perfect forehand. And then afterwards, we'll learn how to properly treat an ankle sprain. We'll meet a former UCF soccer player who's making her dream work for her. And everyone's got their own style of learning. We'll talk about it with one of the experts. United starts now. Hi, thank you for tuning in to United. I'm Steven Helmkamp. Here with me today, I have the head UCF men's tennis coach, Bobby Cashman. Thanks hey, for being Steve. with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Today we're going to be talking about the forehand stroke right. and some of the importance of it. Sure. Um, we discussed earlier some of the things that we talk about with the forehand are the, the contact point, the footwork, and the racket head speed. So those are all important aspects of teaching the forehand. And during some of the practices, I've noticed that you guys do a lot of soft tossing techniques. Right. What's the importance with that? The soft toss actually is really helpful as far as getting the person to know his footwork, the contact point, slowing it down, and showing them the proper finish. But it's, 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 it's really a great way to, to start off and not lose your technique with the stroke. So it's really it's an important aspect. It's, it's similar to what the soft toss does in, in, when you're doing the baseball, when you practice and you swing. Same thing in tennis. You want to break it down. and, and in parts, so it's really important, and we also teach the different spins of the forehand as well. You know, the contact point is really important. So, what's the biggest issue that you see with beginners starting out playing tennis with right. their forehand stroke? The biggest thing with the beginners with their forehand, like anything, is to figure out the balance and the contact point where you meet the ball with the forehand, and that's tough in the beginning because sometimes you're too far away from the ball, sometimes you're overstepping, you're too close with your hip. But I think if you practice and you do a lot of soft toss and a lot of soft feeds, the person practices their footwork and takes the proper steps to the forehand when you teach them how to slide to the ball and, and pivot. And uh, the pivot is really important in getting the racket back as you're preparing for that shot as in any shot. Well, Coach, that sounds awesome. Thank you for all the tips. Let's go check out with some of the UCF men's tennis players and see their proper form. Yes, thanks. I'm here with Blaze and we're going over the forehand ground stroke with a semi-western grip and we're going to break it down and simplify it for you and we're going to show the different positions when he's starting to hit the forehand. The semi-western grip is your hands behind the bevel but the V your hand is on this part of the bevel and, and the knuckle, the first knuckle is right here. That's a semi-western grip and like I said before it's for people who hit a lot of spin on the ball and like the high balls and low balls because of the grip but that semi-western grip you got to be out in front when you hit the ball and, and meet it. Um, the first position Blaze is going to do when he starts hitting the forehand is he's going to pivot his right foot, right, and he's going to get the racket back nice and high like that. Very good. That's the first position Blaze is going to come through. The second position is what? He's going to bring the racket down, right, and then the contact point is right there, which we talked about out in front, but the racket's coming underneath the ball, and then when he finishes, he's going to have a nice swing up and across his shoulder and through. Now. We're gonna go back and break it down a little bit more. The contact point, show me the contact point, please. Okay, this is the key for the, this directs the shot where it's gonna go. If the face is open, the ball goes up. If the face is too down, it's gonna go down in, in the cement. So this, this contact point has to be square with a little bit racket face down so you can cover the ball when you go through it. That is deciding where the ball's gonna go. The angle of that racket, the flexion of the racket, is really important whether you're going down the line, at the guy, or cross court. That's key. This decides where the ball is going to go. And the finish, actually, the racket head speed has to be really good, too, because that, that t tells the pace of the tennis ball how fast you're going to hit through the ball. But as far as Blaze goes, Blaze has got a semi-western grip, which produces a lot of spin. And he starts off and makes a big circle. So you have to be better balanced, and you have to start to swing a little bit earlier when you're actually playing in a match and exchanging with that semi-western forehand, because he's taking a bigger swing. We're going to work on uh, racket head speed footwork and contact point and I'm going to throw some soft toss, I'm going to make some corrections with both of them and this is sometimes what we do in the beginning of practice at UCF. Load up and almost like you're taking a pitcher, down, look at he's sitting on the ball, very good, again, bend down, low, good racket head speed, up and through, up and through, very good, nice. 
As far as that goes, we do a lot of that soft toss to correct the technique and have proper footwork, and it's easy, and it's easy to set up so the person gets in perfect position because the ball's coming slow, so they're working on their technique and exploding through the ball. Brock's gonna do the same. Same, easy toss, Ben Brock. Widen your base, start, stay there. Nice, again. Racket head speed, sit on the ball longer, Brock, finish. Nice, good footwork, get around on that, away from it, away from it, very good. Some common mistakes on the high ball as you're moving forward into the court. Blaze did an excellent job of actually turning his shoulders and loading up. A lot of common mistakes are people having their shoulders face the net and not getting prepared. And the second mistake that's very common is people try to hit flat from this region of the court. You still need to hit spin. You still need to hit spin. If you hit flat and down, you don't, the, the ball will go into the net. You still have to gain spin, engage the racket underneath the ball. So, Blaze did, did two things very well. His footwork was good, but his preparation as far as shoulder turn was perfect, and he applied spin, which is the third thing you need to do at this point of the court. You don't need to hit so flat this far into the court. Even though you're entering into the court, you still need to hit spin. Okay, we're gonna go into some low balls now, Brock. Give him some low balls, some short toss as well. Nice, get down. Blaze is going to really use his legs now and torque in his lower body and stay down and sit on the ball and use the racket head speed very good. Again, down low. Excellent. Very good ball. Look at his eyes and his balance. Look at his knees. His knees are in excellent shape. They're both down. It's like he's sitting on a bench. Ben, excellent. So as you're watching and learning, go over these things with your coach and this will help you in the soft toss. It's an excellent way to gain control of your stroke and technique and balance and go over the, the little things that make you a better player. I'm Steven Helmkamp from the UCF Tennis Facility. Stay tuned, we have more United on the way. Did you know that there's more than one way to study new material? Every person has a certain learning style that works best for them. Stay tuned to United later in the show and find out a few study tips that could save you some time and score you a better grade on your next test. Welcome back to United. I'm Michael Donald. I'm sitting down here with Judd Fan, assistant athletic trainer for football. And we're going to be kind of talking about uh, sprayed ankles and what you can do, what the treatment is, and basically the overall what is a sprained ankle. So Judd, how common of an injury is a sprained ankle in athletics? Uh, in athletics, it's a pretty common injury, um, especially uh, you know once you're coming out of, of being a, a child and getting into your teenage years and your body's starting to develop uh, and you're getting more coordinated and things like that, uh, it's definitely more common to see ankle sprains. As you get stronger and more coordinated and work your way up throughout your athletic career, uh, it's still common, um, but probably not as common. What are the first couple things that you have to do right away when an athlete sprains an ankle? Uh, right away, obviously, we want to make sure that it is a sprained ankle, um, so going through an evaluation. Um, but as far as a treatment standpoint, uh, getting ice on it right away to limit swelling um, and limit uh, um, you know, some of those things that are happening within the ankle uh, is probably the most important thing uh, that you can do. Putting ice on it right away eliminates the swelling, which in then turn uh, usually does what for the ankle? Um, you know, limiting the swelling uh, obviously is going to give you more range of motion. Um, if the ankle joint gets filled with swelling, um, obviously you're not going to be able to move your, move your ankle as much. Um, so the ultimate goal of returning to play after an ankle sprain is getting all this swelling out, getting your range of motion back or being able to move properly uh, and getting your strength back up. So the quicker we can, you know, let that swelling get in there and take care of what it needs to do and then get it back out, um, that's, the, that's the most important thing. Well, thanks, Judd. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the proper treatment of a sprained ankle. Uh, and today we're going to talk about some steps that you can take at home uh, if you think you may have sprained your ankle while you're playing sports or doing anything. Um, the basic principle to follow is the RICE principle. And RICE means rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Okay? So if you think you may have sprained your ankle, the first thing you want to do is make sure that it is an ankle sprain and that you haven't done something worse than sprain your ankle. Okay? So make sure you visit your school's athletic trainer um, or visit a, a, a doctor to make sure that it is an ankle sprain. Okay, so rest is gonna be the first step in the rice principle, okay? So you wanna stay off of your ankle. Allow time for the body to heal uh, and let some of the swelling and things get out. The second step in the rice principle is ice, okay? So we wanna ice your ankle. You wanna ice your ankle for 15 to 20 minutes, um, at least once an hour uh, for the first three days. 
So when you're applying your ice, you want to put the ice bag right over the affected area, or the area that's been injured and that has the most swelling. You can either apply the ice directly to the skin, or you can put something between the ice and your skin if it's too cold, such as a rag or a towel. The third step is compression. You want to use an ace wrap uh, for compression to help push some of the swelling out of your ankle. This is going to help with the overall healing process. To properly apply an ace bandage, you want to wrap from distal to proximal or, for, or from your foot up through your ankle. Okay? To do that, you want to wrap just like this and have it a little bit tighter around the foot and as you work your way up, it would get looser. You can generally stop your ace wrap about at the base of the calf. Okay? After that, you want to make sure that you haven't wrapped the ace bandage too tight. To make sure of that, you can press down on your, your toenail and make sure that it still turns pink. So after you've applied your ace wrap, the last step of rice is elevation. The importance of elevation is so that gravity can help eliminate some of the swelling from your ankle. So in order for that to happen, your ankle needs to be higher than your heart. So if Evan would lay down here on his back, we can put this bolster underneath his ankle where it's nice and supported. And now his ankle is higher than his heart and that's gonna allow for swelling to come out of the ankle. In this case, I'm gonna show you how you can use your ace wrap as the barrier and also as the compression part of your rice principle. First thing you wanna do is start out by applying your ace wrap over the affected area. Once the affected area is covered, then you can apply your ice bag and continue to wrap the ace bandage around the ice bag now. So now we've got a barrier for our ice and we've also got some good compression. So this is the end result of our rice principle. Rest, we have the ice, we have the compression of the ace bandage, and we have the elevation of the ankle above the heart. So once all this is done, you wanna make sure that you ice every 15 to 20 minutes, about once an hour for the first uh, 24 to 72 hours, or the first, first time it happens to about up to three days, okay? If you're still not feeling any relief or, uh, or feeling better after that period, then you need to make sure you see your doctor uh, to make sure that you haven't damaged your ankle further than just an ankle sprain. Time now for our United Trivia question. Which type of learning style uses body movements and interaction to aid in studying? Is it kinesthetic, tactile, auditory, or visual? After the break, we'll have the answer. It's time for the answer to this episode's trivia question. Which type of learning style uses body movements and interaction to aid in studying? The answer is kinesthetic. Coming up later in United, we'll hear from an academic expert on how to make this and the other three learning styles a part of your studying routine. Hi, welcome back to United. Scott Adams here with you. Time for our Where Are They Now segment. And today we meet Alyssa O'Brien, who from 1994 to 1998 played in goal for the UCF soccer team. And after graduating from law school in the Northeast, Alyssa is back here at UCF working in the compliance department where she makes sure both university officials along with those in the athletic department follow NCAA rules and regulations. And as she can tell you, sometimes you can make more than one dream work for you. Um, my degree was in legal studies as an undergrad and so I knew I had this ambition that I wanted to become uh, an attorney at some point and I wanted to go to law school. Um, however, you know, athletics was such a big part of my life, especially in college, and had some good, good success in college with athletics that I really wanted to try to hold on to that for as long as I could. Although I knew I wanted to attend law school, I didn't want to jump right uh, into law school out of undergrad. I wanted to give myself a couple of years. Um, so I started pursuing uh, college coaching jobs. Um, and I, after graduating in December, uh, it took about a month before I found my first job. Um, working for some great head coaches at Clemson University. Ultimately, I decided to get into college athletics and specifically compliance because I learned uh, probably early, in my, late in my first year of law school, um, that college athletics was such a huge part of me 
um, and who I was as an individual from my experiences as a student athlete and a coach that I couldn't let it go. Oh, it's, it's a natural fit that if you are a student athlete to always want to be around that. I mean, four or five years of your life, you're constantly at practices, you're constantly you know, juggling a schedule, you're always around competition, you thrive to be the best. Um, it almost consumes your life when you're a student athlete. Um, however, there was this other side of me that was being pulled by the kind of the legal and, and the, the skill set of that profession that you learn in terms of, you know, attention to detail and um, just the, the type of thinking, the analysis that has to go through um, the process of law, the research that's involved. And I really wanted to find something that spoke to that side of me as well. And I felt like that's where compliance came in into the picture and it was a, a natural fit for those two interests of mine. Um, her time here at UCF obviously was an amazing time in her life and that she wants to come back and give that same experience to our student athletes. It's almost a part of giving back to what she got when she was a student athlete here. And it's not that I'm reliving my college days, but I'm kind of re-experiencing um, those, some of those experiences through a different set of eyes and a different set of circumstances. Well, I think if any of our student athletes or a young person at all looks at Alyssa's life and just shows that um, you can reach your goals with any type of um, effort that you give in, or with great effort. Um, and not to be discouraged that if you go into one field and you decide that's not what you want to do, that you can't turn around and go back to school and do something totally different. I think when, when people are in high school and they're starting to think about what is something that I want to be interested in, what do I want to be when I grow up, I think the one thing to recognize and, and to come to grips with is you don't have to make a decision and be set on that decision. I think you do what you enjoy, you kind of follow your dreams a little bit and see how it all works out for you. You may think that you're interested in one area, but once you actively pursue that area, you find that there's another aspect or another area that you would rather be uh, that makes you a little bit happier. And I think, you know, don't, don't have your, your heart dead set on one thing. Just, you know, keep your eyes open, allow yourself to take in as many different experiences as, poss as possible to try to see where the future is going to take you. As you can see, Alyssa O'Brien has a great sense of fulfillment in being able to give back to an athletic department that gave her so much as a student athlete. Stay right there as we got plenty more United coming up next. Hey, this is LT from 1011 WJRR. You're listening to the best sounds of area music. UCF Athletics, Access Magazine, and WJRR are proud to support local artists. Hello and welcome back to United. I'm here with Christy Belton, the Associate Director of the Academic Services for Student Athletes, to talk about the different learning styles of students. Hi Christy, how are you? Good, how are you? Christy, is it true that people have one style of learning that works better for them over others? Absolutely. Um, there are four main learning styles, kinesthetic, tactile, auditory, and visual. And most people have a combination of one to two of those that are their primary learning styles. Now, what's the main difference between those learning styles? Well, kinesthetic involves movement, so people like to literally move around while they're studying and learning new materials. Uh, tactile involves touching, so for instance, touching their notes, touching note cards and such. Um, auditory is, of course, listening. And visual is, of course, looking at their notes and what have you. So it's based on using their different senses. What is a way you can recommend um, that students find out what you know, works for them the best? There's a few different ways. One, they can actually speak to their high school guidance counselor or academic advisor, um, their teachers, professors, or probably one of the easiest ways which they can do on their own pretty easily is to just Google learning styles and it will pull up probably between 100 um, and 200 different wow. inventories where they can That's do crazy. that'll take a minute or two to test their learning styles and they're free and quick and easy to find out what their styles are and what will work best for them. Chrissy, can you give us some examples of how these students can use these different types of learning styles? Sure. 
Um, auditory obviously would be involved listening. So for instance, they can uh, tape record lectures um, and listen to them over and over again. They can also take their notes and recite them aloud to themselves. Um, and again, so, you know, engaging that listening yeah, that technique. Uh, visual, of course, would be everything from rewriting notes, making flashcards, highlighting, drawing pictures and graphs, um, and really just kind of incorporating different colors and, like I said, literally writing the text down and such. Um, tactile involves touch, so literally walking around with your note cards, with your flashcards, you know, literally just, like I said, to make sure you're touching the things um, and, like I said, and just engaging your hands, so to speak. Um, and then kinesthetic would be movement. You know, some people will literally pace the hallways as they're studying and just constantly be moving around. And that just, for whatever reason, that helps them to learn better. So you can kind of incorporate all of them in, in one big different learning style. That's great. Absolutely. What's the hardest part about finding the right fit and how do you overcome that? I think trial and error. I think um, realizing that, like I said, some people, they know right away that they're visual, that they have to physically see something to learn. Um, but if they're in a class where all the professor does is lecture, it's difficult to, to find that balance and make it work for them. But it's being able to, like I said, work with their teachers and work with their professors to, like I said, make sure that you know, they can still learn successfully, but even though it's an environment that may not best suit their specific learning style. And what's the best advice you can give to a student when they're trying to find their learning style? I think just be patient and then realize too, like I said, there's you know probably one or two different learning styles that can suit them best. So let's work them together and tag team them. Like I said, maybe it is a visual and a tactile. Let's, so it's a visual and a tactile would be maybe using note cards, looking at the flashcards, but yet you're touching them as well. So it's a combination of both. Thanks for coming, Christy. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of United. We'll see you next time. To puzzle my brain, maybe I should start thinking about the times I used to triple. Right.